Hello everyone. In this session, uh, with respect to membrane structure, we will be uh, looking at membrane proteins. So let us look at the learning outcomes of the session. The membrane proteins comprise an array of proteins that are structurally and functionally both diverse, with some being peripheral proteins and some being integral proteins. There are different ways in which these proteins associate with the bilipid layer. And also what has been observed is that uh, from membrane to membrane, the protein to lipid ratio can differ. The membrane proteins contribute to not just dynamism, but they also contribute to the asymmetry and functioning of the membrane. The membrane proteins themselves can be interacting with each other in the membrane or they can be interacting with proteins outside and inside the cell. Now, when you look at membrane proteins and according to what uh, is uh, the proposed model of uh, Singer-Nicholson's fluid mosaic model, uh, you can classify or divide the proteins, membrane proteins into two types, one which is called as the peripheral protein or extrinsic protein and one that is called as integral protein or intrinsic protein. So the basic difference between the peripheral proteins and the integral proteins, so these that you observe are the integral proteins. The name integral, su integral suggests that they are embedded within the bilipid layer, while in case of the peripheral or the extrinsic protein, so you can have peripheral pr protein outside the outer leaflet of the membrane and you can have peripheral proteins inside the inner leaflet of the uh, bilipid layer. So these are present on the outside of the membrane of the bilipid layer. They are not embedded within the bilipid layer and hence they are called as the extrinsic proteins. However, these that you see, many of them being what is called as transmembrane proteins. So as transmembrane proteins, the proteins are folded in such a way that they have an extracellular domain, they have a membrane spanning domain and they have integral proteins. So therefore, what is the understanding? Any integral protein should have a membrane spanning domain. That is something important and that membrane sp uh, spanning domain obviously has to be hydrophobic or else it will not be able to interact with the surrounding lipid uh, molecules in the bilipid layer. So uh, that is how you have the membrane proteins uh, found in the membrane as extrinsic or as integral proteins. Now let us look at integral or intrinsic proteins first. So say for example this is the bilipid layer and here what you are uh, observing is a integral protein and this very much is a transmembrane protein. So you can see that in this protein this is the extracellular domain of the transmembrane protein. This is the membrane spanning domain because this is the one that is traversing the bilipid layer and this is the intracellular domain. So you can see that it distinctively has three different domains, enabling it to get embedded within the bilipid layer because it has the membrane spanning domain. Now, one must understand over here, therefore, that the folding of the proteins is very important. So uh, by folding of proteins, what do we understand? That when you have a linear chain of amino acids, forming a long polypeptide, then that is what is considered to be the primary protein structure. When the peptide bonds of the uh, polypeptide get into a hydrogen uh, bonding, that is they interact with each other through hydrogen bonding to give rise to two, sec two main types of secondary structure. One is what is called as the beta pleated sheets and the other one is what is called as alpha helices. Then a polypeptide that has formed these structures are considered to be secondary protein structures. Now, once you have the secondary protein structure, it can be further looped or it can be further folded through various interactions, could be hydrophobic interactions, could be ionic interactions, could be disulfide linkages, could be Van der Waals forces, could be hydrogen bonding also. And that can lead to a further globular structure of the protein. And this is what is called as a tertiary structure. And generally for proteins, the tertiary structure is the uh, native conformation that it reaches. When we say native conformation, it means that it reaches a conformation in which it is most biologically active. 
Now, uh, there are certain proteins, of course, if need be, you have them present in quaternary structures. That is one or two or more polypeptides can come together to form a complete complex. And that is what is called as a quaternary structure. So evidently, what is necessary for a protein to be functional is its folding. And so even those proteins that are present in the membrane have to be properly folded in order to be functionally active. So what you see over here is called as a single pass transmembrane protein because this protein is traversing the bilipid layer only once. So you have only one membrane spanning domain in the entire polypeptide chain. And this membrane spanning domains are generally observed to be either alpha helices or they are observed to be beta pleated sheaths. Now, suppose it is an alpha helix. So, we all know this is how an alpha helix is. And this alpha helix is formed because of hydrogen bonding that has happened between the peptide bonds. Okay. Now, in an alpha helix that is spanning the membrane or that is traversing the membrane, what is critical or what is important or what is needed is that the amino acid side chains okay, present in the alpha helix all of these side chains need to be nonpolar or hydrophobic in nature so that they can interact with the surrounding uh, phospholipids or sphingolipids or cholesterol, etc. So that becomes extremely important. So you can have the R groups interacting with the acyl chains of uh, the uh, phospholipids or other lipids through hydrophobic interactions. And hydrophobic interactions make the uh, uh, make the entire um, uh, incorporating or embedding of the protein uh, highly stable. What is also observed is that at the at the you know edges of the region which is hydrophobic, that is the edges of the membrane spanning domain. So this domain that is of the alpha helix, okay, has side chains that enable it to be hydrophobic. So on the edges, there may be present amino acids that can have side chains that can interact with the polar heads of the phospholipid. So you must understand that even this interaction enables the protein to be restricted to a region in the uh, bilipid layer. So you can have, therefore, R groups that can interact with polar heads of the phospholipids through ionic interactions. So this is how you can see how a transmembrane protein can be an integral part of the uh, bilipid layer. Now, apart from a single pass transmembrane protein, you can also have multi-pass transmembrane protein. As you can observe over here, you have this polypeptide and this is a single polypeptide chain. It's a long single polypeptide chain that is traversing the membrane seven times. So as you can see, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So there are seven alpha helix domains that are hydrophobic. So you can, you can basically understand that there is a stretch of amino acid that forms an alpha helix. And the stretch of amino acids are such that they have a higher percentage of hydrophobic amino acids because these domains will have to interact with the phospholipid bilayer. So this over here is basically an example of a bacteria uh, transmembrane protein. And this is what is called as bacteriorhodopsin. And bacteriorhodopsin is generally used by halobacterium uh, to uh, synthesize ATP. So it is able to uh, work in such a way that it allows protons to be, uh, protons to be pumped out. And uh, the energy that is derived from that is used to produce ATP. So therefore, as very clearly observed, this has seven membrane spanning alpha helices. So you will not call this as a single pass transmembrane protein. You will now call this as a multi-pass transmembrane protein because this polypeptide is traversing the bilipid layer seven times, more than one time. And therefore, it is called as the multi-pass transmembrane proteins. And you have seven different domains that are interacting with the bilipid layer. Now, apart from alpha helices, one can also have beta sheets that can form 
barrel shapes and these barrel shaped beta shape uh, uh, sorry beta sheet structures can also traverse the bilipid layer so as you can see over here this molecule that is present uh, has a trimeric protein which means that effectively it's a quaternary structure you have three such uh, units forming what is called as the perforin in perf one of the perfor perforin uh, molecules in the e coli so this 16 beta strands are kind of forming a barrel like shape for one ompf unit and this ompf is basically a trimeric porin found in the e coli so it allows transport across and uh, you can see how it is traversing the membrane but this time it is not alpha helices this time it is the beta sheets so here too the r groups that are present on the surface of this structure barrel shaped structure would be enabling it to interact with the bilipid layer so this is also an example of multipass transmembrane protein because you have several beta sheets that are traversing the membrane and hence it is called as a multipass transmembrane protein now we look at peripheral or extrinsic proteins and how they are basically associated with the membrane so one of the common ways by which an extrinsic protein is bound to the membrane so what is understood is that the peripheral proteins are not directly uh, binding or very rarely directly um, getting into the bilipid layer so as you can see over here this thai one protein is actually in, is interacting with glyco c glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol so we know that you have a, a membrane phospholipids called phosphatidyl inositol and on the inositol you can have an oligosaccharide bound so this moiety so you basically understand that this is now a glycolipid okay and this glycolipid so this is specifically called as glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol and this can bind to the cysteine residue of a protein so therefore the protein is a peripheral protein but it is associated with the membrane through the gpi structure so such proteins are called as gpi anchored proteins and invariably gpr anchored proteins are found only on the outer surface so again you can therefore make out that because you have these gpi anchored proteins present on the outside of the membrane and not inside you can already see that there is asymmetry you will never have such gpi anchored proteins present in the intracellular uh, intracellular uh, part of the membrane so therefore you can clearly observe that the way the protein is anchoring to the membrane already makes the membrane further asymmetric so it is not only the lipids that contribute to asymmetry of the bilipid layer but it is also how the proteins are associated with the membrane that leads to asymmetry now two other ways uh, by which you can have the proteins associated with the lipids and peripheral proteins per se is say for example you have a farnesyl group this is a long hydrocarbon chain okay uh, that is uh, so it's fatty acid basically and this fatty acid is linked to the cysteine uh, moiety of a protein okay so the ras protein is bound to the membrane through farnesyl fatty acid and also through the palmitate so therefore you can see how the protein is bound to the membrane but it is only present on the outside it is not present within the bilipid layer so therefore it becomes an extrinsic protein similarly you can have a myristic acid which is again a, a, a fatty acid chain that can bind again to uh, uh, several proteins so you can have myristoylated proteins also present so uh, when you have such such proteins then they are considered to be lipoylated proteins which means that the proteins are conjugated with the lipids and the lipid component of the conjugated protein enters or is embedded within the bilipid layer so that is how these proteins that are peripheral are anchored to the bilipid layer now interesting and already observed is that uh, we know that there are many uh, lipid components like glycolipids um, uh, uh, you know palmitoylated transmembrane proteins sphingomyelin cholesterol they all can come together to form what is called as a micro domain or what we also known uh, know as a lipid raft 
So GPI anchor proteins are also able to interact with glycolipids, cholesterol, etc. to become part of the lipid rafts. And as part of the lipid rafts, they are able to carry out specific biological functions. So therefore, this is also very important that the peripheral proteins are able to interact with the lipids that are present in a, um, in a micro domain. So in fact, lipid rafts therefore will have several proteins whether they are transmembrane proteins or whether they are peripheral proteins being part of the lipid draft. So let us look at uh, the different ways by which the uh, membrane proteins are associated. You can see that this is a single pass. Uh, uh, this is a single pass uh, uh, membrane protein. But in this case, what you observe is that this protein uh, effectively does not have much of an extracellular domain. Uh, a specified extra, uh, it has an extracellular domain. But here, what is the difference between these two? Both of these are single pass transmembrane proteins. But in this case, the C terminus is present uh, intracellular and the N terminus is present extracellular. While in this case, the C terminus is present extracellular and the N terminus is present intracellular. So you can have the anchoring of the single pass transmembrane proteins occurring in either way. Then you, of course, have the multi-pass multi transmembrane proteins. You have the meristoylated, palmitoylated, or lipoylated um, um, peripheral proteins. You have the GPI-anchored peripheral proteins. You have another way by which the peripheral proteins can be associated. The peripheral proteins can interact with a transmembrane protein. So it is the transmembrane protein that is holding the peripheral protein. And this too can be a way by which you can have the membrane a peripheral protein associated with the bilipid layer. So it is indirectly associated with the membrane. It does not have any direct connection with the uh, bilipid layer. Now two other interactions that have been observed is that when a protein okay, has a, a stretch of amino acid that forms an amphipathic helix, then that amphipathic helix can interact with the uh, polar heads a stretch of polar heads of the phospholipids that are present in the membrane. So you can see that here is where there is an interaction. So the protein is always present outside or it can be present inside, but it is not getting embedded within the bilipid layer. Another way by which a peripheral protein can be associated is that it has a very small loop in which you have a set of hydrophobic amino acids. So those set of hydrophobic amino acids can interact with the acyl groups of the phospholipids and therefore it can, it can kind of get anchored. So these are the different ways by which the membrane protein can be associated with the bilipid layer. So let us make the conclusions. Membrane proteins are constituted, constituted by peripheral proteins and integral proteins with each contributing the diverse functions of the cell membrane. So you must understand that because they are part of the membrane, these uh, proteins can take part in uh, interacting with other proteins outside the cell, interacting with proteins inside the cell. They can take part in transport across the membrane. They can take part in cell-cell interaction. They can take part in cell signaling. So there are various different functions with which these membrane proteins are associated. The integral proteins are embedded in the bilipid layer due to the presence of hydrophobic domains. That could be alpha helix or beta pleated, beta pleated sheet structures. The integral proteins can be single pass or multi pass transmembrane proteins, with its domains being present extracellular as well as intracellular. The peripheral proteins are able to associate with the bilipid layer through various interactions, such as through lipoylation, GPI anchoring, hydrophobic loops, etc. So, membrane proteins, diverse in their structures and functions, interact with the bilipid layer by various ways, with each interaction being a consequence of a properly folded protein. This is important. Thank you.